Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. If you're already a subscriber, let me just offer my gratitude for your ongoing support. You know very well that subscribers not only receive new content, directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly. And that includes me. So, you know, if you wanted a way to talk to me, that's it. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as every podcast, video, and written article by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, my guest today is Duncan Baskaran brown Hi, Duncan. Hello, well, thank you very much for having me. I'm I'm looking forward to having a bit of a chat. Thank you. No, I thank you for showing up. Also, wait until the end, because you know you're looking forward to it now. But wait until the yeah, wait until we actually talk, and and, and then you'll see. It was they were unfounded expectations. So <laughs> no, uh, we're we're going to have some fun. We've been chatting already. I know we're going to right? have some fun. <laughs> So Duncan is a speaker, an author, a sober coach, and also a Morris dancer. And, and you know that's coming up later, right? So yeah, we'll talk about that. Duncan is also author of the book, Get Over Indulgence. And so Duncan coaches people out of a dependence on alcohol and actually out of an unhealthy lifestyle. And I want to tell you, there is sort of a personal, there is a personal story to this because I have struggled with alcohol or I struggled with alcohol earlier in my life. And and so, uh, yeah, I don't know how much I want to talk about myself, but there, there's a lot of, um, there's some history and I'm glad that I, that we're going to have this opportunity to talk. So I love asking at the very beginning, just like a, a you know, your early story. I got to figure on your website, you say you used to indulge and then you stopped. So can you tell me, first of all, like what what made the pre sober Duncan? What, what was the childhood like that, that brought you to a point where bef just before you decided I'm going to change? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it does, I think, go back to my childhood. I, I didn't have a, a really difficult childhood. There were difficulties in it and there was dysfunction. Absolutely. But I wouldn't have what you would call a classic kind of uh, unstable childhood. I mean, my parents are happily married, still are. Um, I was very lucky. I mean, I didn't want for anything materially. I struggled a lot at school. Uh, they, they didn't design schools for people like me. I, I mean, if you want to be cynical, I suppose you could say the purpose of school is to create employees. And yes. I am unemployable. So it just it was it was not going to work. Um, so, you know, my, my my teachers, they had expectations, you know, and I had expectations and those two things sort of never really, never really met up. So, yeah, school was school was not great. Uh, and it never really gave me a place where I felt I could succeed where I felt I could validate myself, you know, I, sure. I, it, it was, it was the way I felt like I was measured in life was my success in school. And that was pretty much non-existent. So I think, you know, that, that gives your sense of self a little bit of a knock, doesn't it? And then I, I got to uh, the teenage years and had all of these kind of like, kind of contrary uh, desires, you know, like one, I had the desire to talk to that really pretty girl from Form F, but then I also had the desire to just run away and hide, you know, and it was this kind of like tension of, of, of wanting to socialize, but being quite afraid of it, not finding yeah. my place. And then I stood outside of a, a party one day and uh, my good friend Hank said, oh, drink this, Duncan. So I, I drank it and, uh, you know, maybe I drank another one after that as well. And then, the, the, like, it started in my toes, worked, my, worked its way up through my legs, stomach, chest, and it hit my head. And all of a sudden I had the confidence uh, and I walked right. into that party and I went and talked to the pretty girl from 4 Meth. And, yeah, the rest is kind of history. You know, when I 
<clears throat> started drinking, it seemed to fill in a lot of gaps. It seemed to really help me find my place and be the person that I thought I wanted to be. So yeah, like I was all in from the start, but as time went on, you know, it went from being something that was very sociable. I drink a little bit with people on the weekend. Uh, you know, over time, the amount of people I drank with went down, but the amount that I drank went up and I took it to its logical conclusions. And I pretty much ended up on my own, sitting in my flat, drinking a couple of bottles of wine every day. And that is not much fun. No, no, it isn't. So, I mean, you've given me a, a picture somewhat similar to mine. And I know what happened to me. What Something must have snapped. At some point you go, okay, no more. What happened? So, I, on one level, my life was really going quite well. You know, on one level, I was very successful. I uh, had a, a career in local politics. Um, I became mayor of my hometown at a disturbingly young age. I had a beautiful uh, wife. We had a nice place to live. You know, it was all going really rather well, sort of. <laughs> it looked that way. And if you'd asked, I would have told you because I do talk a good game. And we, we got to the point where it's like, well, let's do the most adulty thing because we're, we're adults now. Let's let's start a family. And that was fun. Well, I mean, the trying bit was fun. And <laughs> then, you know, as soon as my wife got pregnant, we just we turned into that couple. You know, that just like stupid, naive, they've got no idea what they've let themselves in for. And it was all very jolly until my wife had a miscarriage and all of a sudden it was very terrible. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, obviously, you know, that was really hard on her emotionally, physically, mentally. It was a huge strain. But I know now what made it a lot worse was the fact that I just wasn't there for her. You know, okay. my response to difficult times, hard emotions was always just to pour myself into a bottle of wine, which is precisely right. what I did. And I kind of abandoned her. And it got it got quite dicey it got quite uncomfortable um and that kind of made me think and i'd love to say there was this sort of like moodily lit moment at 4 a.m staring into the bathroom window when it all kind of clicked into place but i think for me it was over a couple of months i, I really spent a lot of time thinking about you know what did i want from life you know what was the point of duncan and yeah. it got down to I, well, I can see it now that it, it really came down to this single question. I wouldn't have articulated it at the time, but but now I can see I was just asking myself one question. What do you want, Duncan? Do you want another drink or do you want to start a family? Of course, the good news is I, I made the right decision. And yeah. almost nine months to the day after I stopped drinking, our daughter was born. And that was amazing. That was awesome. That was fantastic for about 10 minutes and then of course your world suddenly fills up with a whole other load of problems but those are good problems they're better problems so do, i mean my experience was was also came because of our son but it took me another year after our son was born actually to quit did and i guess the question i want to ask is like didn't didn't that hurt? Like, didn't didn't you go, oh, my gosh, I got to go crawl back into a bottle of wine because you have a kid waking you up at two in the morning to be fed. And I mean, it's a tough six months at the very least. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't like to brag, but it was a <laughs> it was it was properly tough because my wife got very ill uh, oh. when our daughter was about six months old. So I kind of. Uh, I spent a little bit of time almost as a single parent, which was was very tough. I was working at the time, trying to find my way in life. Uh, yeah, it was difficult. Uh, I, but I can put my hand on my heart and I, I tell you absolutely damn straight, not once did I ever think, ah, oh, I want to wow. have a drink. Because yeah, wow. I got to the point with alcohol where I no longer believed it would help me. I no longer believed it would do anything for me. And that just meant 
you know, if I don't believe it's going to make my life better, why would I drink it? I, I mean, total honesty and uh, transparency. I did eat a lot of triple chocolate chip cookies uh, in that period. Uh, I ate a lot of um, frozen pizza. And actually, I got to the point uh, when my daughter was quite young, when I realized I was eating pretty much the same way I used to drink. So I didn't go I back see. to drinking. I, I, I'm not <laughs> not perfect <laughs> quite far from it um i yeah i did transfer my uh, my uh, indulgence from alcohol to uh, sugar which is not enormously un uncommon but once i recognized it i used the same sort of things uh that i did to to get past the wine to um clean up my diet and uh yeah i know actually i i can't even give you a proper date but it's probably six or seven years um, since I've really cleaned up my my act and been living uh, what I would say is my best life. Yeah, that's a whole shift of perspective. I mean, you had said you realized that the wine wouldn't give you, I forget exactly how you put it, I'm sorry now, but you said it, that it wouldn't help or it wouldn't give you what you wanted out of it. That's a whole like shift of of of. I mean, it's a whole shift of perspective. How did you how did you develop that? So <clears throat> I think that's one of the pieces of behavior change that a lot of people miss. <clears throat> so what a lot of people do when they want to change their behavior is they just focus on the action. They mm. think if I can stop doing the action for long enough, I'll be all right. But that very rarely works. What I did, and not because I'm some sort of like genius, but simply because that is the process of cognitive realignment, which is kind of similar to cognitive behavior therapy, which I'm sure all of your listeners have heard of. Uh, sure. The idea is that you get to grips with your beliefs first. So you start to look at those beliefs. And we all have beliefs about alcohol. Uh, you know, many people believe that it helps them to deal with stress. I certainly believe that. Uh, I believe that I couldn't cope with the difficult things in life without a drink. Yeah. Many people believe it helps them to socialize. A lot of people, there's a, you know, a lot of beliefs around dating, relationships and sex and alcohol. There's a lot of beliefs around creativity. Uh, there's a lot of beliefs around business. Uh, a huge amount of beliefs around alcohol. And what I encourage people to do, what I think you need to, to, to ask yourself are some pretty basic questions. You've got to ask yourself, number one, is it true? You know, what you believe about alcohol, is it actually true? Like, does alcohol make you look sophisticated or have you just watched too many James Bond films? <laughs> uh, so start off by asking if it's true and then move on to a slightly more kind of uh, deeper question, a more subtle question. Like, is it actually helping? Is it helping you become the person that you want to be? Is your belief that alcohol help makes you more creative? Creative Is that actually helping you write that novel or paint that picture or perform in that show? And once you've kind of got rid of those beliefs and, you know, disposed of the ones that aren't serving you and aren't true anymore, then there's a little bit of work that I recommend people do around the thought process. So you could look at all actions you know, as stimulus and response, uh, it's a very behavioralist way of looking at things I know, but something happens and we respond in a particular way. And there is always a moment between what happens and the way we respond. And you have an opportunity during that moment to think something differently. So that's the kind of thought management piece. Some people talk about cravings, uh, but I don't think that's particularly helpful. It's just a big scary word that means thoughts at the end of the day. So, yeah, I help people do a little bit of the thought management piece. And then the behaviors are the easy bit. You know, if you've got the beliefs, if you've got the thoughts, if you've got those lined up, then the behaviors are definitely the easy bit. Mm -hmm. I'm actually 100 percent on board with all of that. I've got to ask the, the big the big elephant in the room. How many people? do you know that can walk through that level of introspection like on their own? You did, I did. Yeah, That's I, not I think most people are capable of doing that. I, I think reflection is something that is not highly prized or lauded no. within our society, which is a shame because yes. um, I think 
if you look at the statistics, if you look at the way that people learn, uh, you could, I think it's something like 30, 35% of people learn through introspection. So it's actually quite wow. common, but we don't talk okay. about it. And I think that is, that is a huge shame. What my experience as a coach and as a therapist would have me believe that like, literally anybody is capable of it. Uh, you, you can sit down and, and think about what it is that underpins your behaviors. You can mm -hmm. get to grips with your beliefs. You can have those realizations. In fact, most people have those realizations quite often. You know, we have those like little things that make our, make us go, I never saw it like that. You know, it, might not be an everyday occurrence, but I think if, if it's not happening at least weekly, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> well, true. I, you had said fact, reflection. It is... happened to me today when I was I, I was okay. running this morning, and I realised that the conkers, you know, they come from trees. They're like the little yeah. There's a game uh, we play in the UK. I don't know whether you play it in America or not, but it's called conkers, where you put the little conkers on a string and you bash them together, and oh, cool. you know. I, I realized that conquers is actually like the word conquer. So if you win a game of conquers, you have conquered somebody. <laughs> I'd never realized that those two words were actually weirdly related. So, uh, yes, that kind of stuff happens to people all of the time. And I believe we just need to harness that ability. You know, when you're walking the dog or you're having a shower and you go, oh, yeah, we just need to harness that. It happens to everyone. I agree with you. It's it's what you say. The reflection is not highly prized. Action is. Action is we go, well, what have you done? Not what have you thought? Which by the way, your um your like etymological, um maybe not etymological, but somewhat etymological uh musings there. I do that all the time. I love language <clears throat> and I do that. I there there's a word in Hungarian, does make a difference what it is, but it's it's the command, come. And then the word for children, they only differ by one letter. And I went, or for child, excuse me, they only differ by one letter. I asked my mother, my mother-in-law at one point, I'm like, did you ever notice that this word and this word only differ by one letter? And they're totally different. And she goes, no, why are you thinking about this? And I'm like, mm, okay, sorry. But Reflection. Sorry, that was one of those tangents. Remember I told you we'll have like ridiculous tangents? Language tangent there. But any any tangent about language is is fine by me. Is fun. It is. Um so reflection though, I don't like it's hard. I don't know that the it's it seems uncommon to me because much of what I talk about is introspection, identity, finding who you are. And that seems like the hard part. Yeah, I, I think it is not something that people are necessarily used to doing in a structured way on their own. So mm -hmm. that, like, <laughs> that is why you need a coach, my friend. <laughs> exactly. Not, not just a plug for me, but for the entire idea of coaching. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the really amazing realizations that I've had in life have come from mm -hmm other people asking me pertinent questions uh right. not always in a coaching context i happen to have a lot of friends who are coaches so i have I happen to have a lot of friends that ask really good questions but i mean i think most people know that person who who is genuinely interested in in what you're doing and that they they do ask questions and sometimes you know, that kind of beginner's mind, that naivety that they bring makes you reconsider what you're doing in a hugely big way. So, yes, uh, yes I mean, get a coach. But like, yeah, there are many other things that can fulfill that. Uh, you know, they do, uh, a, a good personal trainer at the gym will, will do some wonderful coaching. Uh, a good right. a pastor or preacher or vicar or whatever religious leader uh, you like, a sponsor in AA, a mentor, a in, in business or at work if you're like a you know little league soccer coach <laughs> you know sometimes they they ask the questions don't they yeah yeah i want i want to turn this just a little bit because what i identified at least in my own drinking and i don't want to talk about all my childhood but my uh, you know my childhood was not particularly supportive 
And I looked at drinking as a form of self-harm because I wanted to hurt myself. And, and waking up in the morning with this just blinding headache was a form of validation because I deserve to be hurt. Do you see, is that common? Do you see that in your coaching? Is that common? Yes. Yeah, I, I definitely. I, I mean, I think there's <laughs> like we could probably have an entire podcast just about that. I mean, it's such an mm. interesting subject. Yes, I, I definitely see a lot of people who don't believe they are worth anything better than where they are and where they are is usually quite miserable. And that yeah. that is a huge issue. I, I see um, self-sabotage as well. I think people sometimes are a bit scared of their own potential and therefore, you know, subconsciously, they're trying to uh, reduce themselves. Um, so that's that's a huge, huge thing. And I mean, the research that, that, that we've done suggests that Trauma underpins quite a lot of drinking, not all of drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people uh, with with issues around drinking will identify as having uh, childhood trauma. Um, many of them will point to a particular traumatic event in their adulthood, uh, divorces, losing jobs or businesses, car accidents, things like that come up an awful lot. They sort of feel like they were a relatively normal drinker and it was sort of ticking along okay-ish until that traumatic event and that was what you know sparked a a marked increase in their drinking but then we also meet a lot of people who talk about uh you know not not what i would describe as traumatic events in their childhood but just wanting to fit in similar to my own sure. story you know that hanging out with people who drank not necessarily wanting to drink but hanging out with people who were drinking and then getting into it and then it is one of those things that if you do it enough it starts to become something that you do all of the time that's one of mm -hmm. the things that's very common is repeated exposure at a young age so uh, yeah there are there are lots of different factors but but definitely i think all of that kind of that unprocessed trauma that that kind of pain that exists within people yeah it definitely leads to those ideas of self sabotage and lacking in worth and yeah i see yeah. those quite regularly you had mentioned there was a certain demographic too that, that would be unexpected that the that, that drinking especially that that overindulgence affects the most what is that demographic because now i want to be surprised well, so with alcohol it's people with money <laughs> you know that, that that's something that a lot of people i think they really miss with alcohol what they think of as somebody like a problem drinker, you know, they, they don't have a house. They don't have a car. Right. They don't have a driving license anymore. They, they've lost their family. You know, they are at the very bottom of society. But actually, the more you earn, the more you drink. So the higher up the mm. tree you get, the more likely you are to find people drinking. So if you look at the statistics, uh, I think it's 47% of high-earning college graduates in America drank yesterday. 47 slightly oh worrying because what are high earning college graduates that's your lawyer and your surgeon two people who you probably don't want to have drunk yesterday um and that's one of the reasons why the world health organization recommends that business executives are screened annually for uh, alcohol use oh, wow. and that i think that shocks a lot of people because they they think of the exact opposite of being mm -hmm. the people, you know, right at the bottom of society that, that are going to have the problems. But actually, you know, the, the higher up the tree you get, the more likely you are to find alcohol problems. Interesting. Interesting. W what about, is is it more of a, because, yeah, I mean, I had the same sort of idea that you've got the people living under a bridge. Oh, there was a Saturday Night Live thing that I'm blanking on, living in a van by the river or something like that. Um, does that like what about like CEO level people? I mean, that's uh, I mean, it increases. I mean, it's commensurate there. Be, a CEO level person would drink more than, say, the janitor in the company. 
Well, statistically, yes, they, they are oh. likely to. Uh, and there's yeah, <laughs> there's a couple of other things going into that as well. So uh, men are more likely to drink than women. Uh, men are also more likely to earn more than women. Uh, right. White people drink more than any other ethnic group. Um, and the older you are, generally, the more you drink. So most huh. people increase their drinking throughout their lives. So what's the CEO likely to look like? He's likely yeah. to be an old Older white guy, white isn't he? Man. And what's yeah. the janitor likely to look like? I don't know. But he oh. might be an African-American and he might be a lot That's younger. A so, yeah, there's absolutely the, – the CEO is far more likely to have a problem with drinking than the Yeah. Family. And that in itself is very, very worrying because that sets the tone for the company, doesn't it? And that's why you see so many businesses, they seem to revolve around alcohol. Everything they do, the the only way they know how to celebrate things, the only way they know how to socialize, the gifts they give, it seems to revolve around alcohol. And then it just becomes this kind of treadmill. All of the people who start off at the bottom and want to get to the top, you know, the young graduates in the company they all want to aspire to be the ceo the only way to really get a decent conversation with the ceo is to stay up late drinking in the bar with him and it just becomes this kind of perpetuating cycle and i think a lot of companies have gone a really long way to bring well-being and mental health awareness into what they do and you know that is fantastic it's so important I think the thing that needs to happen is they need to make that extra link. You know, they need to realize that one of the primary determinants of your well-being is the amount you drink and that most mental health problems are one way or another related to alcohol. Either they increase your likelihood of drinking or they are actually caused by drinking. So we just need to sort of start to realize that that mental health and wellness are both tied up with alcohol and then start that discussion and maybe create some environments that are a little bit more friendly to people who don't drink and, uh, you know, offer people the support that they need if they they are drinking too much. Yeah, that's a much. That's a much deeper like more profound effect on society, like a bigger social effect than I thought, especially when you talk about like the lawyers and the surgeons, it's like, yeah, you really don't want those people to wake up with that blinding headache. Cause you know, they could be holding your lives in your hand. You're well, hopefully you don't have more than one, but they could be holding your life in your hand. Uh, you know, and you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not listening to myself, but I mean, it's not it's, just it's not just waking up with a hangover. It's not just that blinding yeah. headache. It, it's a couple of drinks are going to put you off your game. So mm. I think that's something that science is really, you know, the evidence is is stacking up against uh, what what most people consider to be moderate drinking. Struggling mm. not to do air quotes around that one, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, just those couple of drinks can can cause quite a profound effect. So two drinks is enough to uh, reduce the quality of your sleep by 24%. And that attacks the the, the very important deep sleep, the restorative sleep, you know, where you really refresh and recharge yourself. So, you know, would you want would you want your surgeon just tired? No, you wouldn't. Uh, in addition uh, to those two drinks could be enough to raise your cortisol levels by 18%. And I'm sure your listeners all know that cortisol is a stress hormone. So do you want your surgeon stressed? Probably not. No. Also, long term moderate drinking at that kind of two drink level uh you know it's also uh, correlated with um smaller brains uh there is a study published recently um uh, in in the uk tracked and a lot of people for many many years people who are drinking at that moderate level uh you know they actually had smaller brains than the people who weren't drinking so uh i don't know i want a big brain surgeon personally (laughs) right i would prefer that well, what you said you struggled not to use air quotes. Okay, what is moderate drinking? What does that What does that mean? Well, I, I think the road to hell is paved with moderation. Sure. What does moderate drinking mean? So I I, I don't really like the phrase moderate drinking because 
what when you say moderate drinking, what people just like they have their own definition of it. And there was some research done recently that found actually quite a lot of people consider not drinking first thing in the morning to be moderate drinking. So anything short of flat out, you know, like. 150 unit a week drinking they consider to be moderate so by their rationale i would have been a moderate drinker because i never drank before eight nine o'clock in the evening i never did that so uh, yeah i was a moderate drinker um what i consider to be low level drinking so if you if you want to drink no i'm not going to stand in your way uh but what i would recommend as the lowest risk level of drinking would be no more than one drink at a time that's no more than one drink a day uh, not one in each hand uh, no more than one <laughs> drink a day no more than twice a week and no more than three weeks a month uh, and if you drink that i am pretty confident you will not have any long-term health issues from your drinking and you won't really suffer from any of those short-term consequences a mm-hmm. lot of the, what the, the science is telling us is that it is actually that second drink that causes a lot of the problems and the really interesting thing from my point of view is that that second drink is not any more enjoyable we, most of the pleasure around drinking is reported in that first drink but everybody kind of chases it they think that they're going to get the same amount of pleasure from the second drink, but you, they don't. They get the pleasure in the first drink, and then they get the problems from the second drink. So that's, I think, the message that I'd really like people to appreciate is if you yeah. want to drink, drink at that lower level, and you actually get more pleasure from it. Right. I've, I've got to ask, because first of all, with the levels that you just said, they're because it was no more than one drink at a time, no more than twice a week, no more than three weeks out of a month, which was a great, It's that's an easy mnemonic, right? Which is one, two, three, not too hard. I think most people, like when I was in college, people would have laughed at that. They would have, come on, you can't do oh, that. Yeah, when I was in college, I would have laughed at that. Right? True, I would have as well. Um, so do I... And if you go, no, I don't want to answer this question, that's fine. Are you able to indulge safely? I mean, what you would consider safely now? So do you think, uh, sorry, was that, am I capable of drinking yes, like that? Yes, I'm sorry. Are you? Am I, I? Honestly, I don't know because I've not really tried it. I, okay. I, I, I did spend a lot of time thinking uh, about whether it whether I could safely drink again, as it were. Um, mm-hmm. So I stopped about nine and a half years ago now. And, uh, you know, that's been quite a long time, hasn't it? But I sort of concluded that the only point in my life it would be safe for me to drink would be if I didn't want to drink. And then what would be the point in yeah. doing it? It sort of like <laughs> comes back to that. Um, and as I said, said, you know, almost at the start... I don't believe I'd get any benefits from drinking. So why would I do it? Um, Mm -hmm. No, I mean, the conventional wisdom is that (laughs) if I have one drink, I will go on a five day bender and end up in Las Vegas with a tattoo. (laughs) Right. Uh, I do not believe that that is true because uh, I was actually doing this weird amateur dramatics thing a few years ago. And it's a, a really short play that we perform repeatedly again and again and again around Christmas. And uh, I, there's five parts in it. I've played all five parts and we m- m- swap around and it's never the same people uh, each time. So uh, I was the, uh, the, 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 the one who lies on the floor and they pour some whiskey into his throat and the guy who was playing the doctor who does the pouring just forgot i don't drink and poured a fairly substantial measure of jack daniels down my throat which (laughs) of course means i should have gone crazy and ended up in vegas with a tattoo but i didn't so uh maybe maybe i could i don't know i have no real desire to find out and i think you know I i i think there's a fairly strong case that i have changed the way my brain reacts to alcohol Mm -hmm. Uh, you know which sounds really really bad oh man you changed your brain and it's like well it is it is really bad if you put alcohol into your brain of course if you don't then it doesn't really matter at all so i have no real desire to drink like that uh so i've never never tried it maybe i could 
Um, but what would be the advantage of it? I'd certainly, if people have got some sober time under their belt and they're thinking about doing it, my advice would be don't, because that sure. one usually ends up badly. Yeah. Do you, can I share my story a little bit? Do you mind me? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Okay. Go wild. I mean, it's my show, but, you know, I don't want to. <laughs> the When I quit drinking, so I quit drinking in 20... I don't even know, 2013, I guess it was. Yeah. And I brought up self-harm earlier because it was a form of it. And, and I, I wanted, I wanted to hurt. I believe I deserved to hurt. And so drinking was a way of, of masking myself. It was a way of harming myself. And more recently, and I found this phenomenal. I more recently actually went on a, on a little vacation and I went to, I was alone too. So I went to a, to a place where I thought I was going to get food. turns out it was a bar only. And they had like some, they had like some appetizers, but I'm sitting there and I'm like, Oh, maybe I'll just order a glass of wine. Like, I'm like, I don't even, I don't felt like kind of weird. Cause I'm like, what am I doing in this place? I could have just left, but it didn't for whatever stupid reason. So I have found now, 11 years later, I am capable of drinking, but it's because it's because the purpose changed. 11 years ago, what I wanted to do was hurt myself. And if I have a drink now, it's, it feels like celebration. And, and I actually, when I had that, the first conversation with my wife about it, I actually started crying because it, it was a huge revelation to realize that it's possible to have a life in which you celebrate yourself. And obviously this was relatively recent. It's only been two years since I transitioned gender. And, and I think that was a huge part of it. But it was such a major psychological change that I experienced to go from from hating who I was to to loving who I am. Anyway, I, the, I was kind of hoping I was going to have a good ending to that, and I didn't. Come, I didn't really come oh, up with one. Beautiful enough that it doesn't need a big punch. <laughs> good, good, but I, it was it was an interesting insight to have that that it is possible to do that. I think it is possible to 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 have intoxicants whatever however you want to define that because i know there are people who say well garlic garlic's an intoxicant and you go hmm, okay but i think it's possible but you have to have that mindset you can't have a mindset and i think i'm saying the same as you you know if if you maybe what i'm saying is i don't want to drink i just happen to and and it's and it's different from from how it was 11 years ago I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I know some people who practice what they what often gets termed as ninety nine percent sobriety, yeah. uh, whereby they genuinely don't drink other than at weddings. And how many weddings do you go to a year? You know, that's that's why like one percent of the year is three point six five days, isn't it? So sure. you're allowed to drink three and a half times a year. Uh, you're gonna maybe save the half up for next year. I don't know, but <laughs> I, that does kind of like approximately tally with the number of weddings that one might go to. And Good yeah, point. I mean, a friend of mine, not drunk for a long time, but he just said, "I think I think it would be weird not to drink champagne at my daughter's wedding." And I'm just like, "Dude, there are so many great." Uh, well, we were talking about tea earlier. One of my favourites. Uh, there's a sparkling um, kind of Darjeeling, uh, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and it does it does have that kind of slightly bitter tang to it that tastes a little bit like champagne. So mm -hmm. I laughed at him because there are great alternatives to uh, champagne. But for him, that was what he kind of felt. And, you know, he, he didn't go on a huge bender and end up in Las Vegas. Uh, I mean, right. I, I think it's testament to the amount of work that you've done, you know, in those intervening periods that you've gone from the, the point where you were to the point where you are and where you are now is so far from where you were that, uh, you know, it's not like one little thing is going to push you back into that self-destructive behavior. And that's, you know, another thing that I think is very interesting. Uh, there's always a bit of a debate in, in 
in certain circles about whether it is easier to do the work before you stop drinking or stop drinking before you do the work. Uh, my personal view is stop drinking. It makes doing stop the work Stop drinking easier. first. Yes. Agreed. Which, I, which I, I can see you're kind of agreeing with, but I can't actually argue with the fact that I know people who've done it the other way around. I know people really? who have done the therapy and then the drinking has just fallen away because huh. they no longer kind of felt the need to drink so it is it is a journey uh it is a transformation it is all of those mm -hmm. kind of things and you know if you get closer to where you actually want to be i think it matters an awful lot less although i do have to repeat that you know i have met more people who have tried to go back to drinking in a controlled way and not enjoyed it and it's gone wrong than I yeah. have who are comfortable and happy with it so if you have any doubt <laughs> the easiest way to control your drinking just don't is do not it. to drink at all yeah agreed no I agree and I honestly I've been surprised because because I thought there's no chance in hell I thought yeah. there's no chance in hell and I you know with that first glass of wine for what it's worth I mean I left half of it there because I was like I don't know what I feel right now. It's a weird, it was a weird, and it took me a lot of time thinking about that to go, well, what changed? What is, what is the, cause it's the behavior itself that changed the whole concept of the behavior changed. And anyway. I, I mean, a big, I'm a big fan of BJ Fogg. I think tiny habits is one of the best books about behavior change ever written. Although only about building positive uh, behavior uh, actually sure. removing negative behaviors he doesn't know anything about and most of what he says <laughs> is complete junk um yeah same like james clear everybody loves atomic habits i get that but james sure. clear never smoked so don't take stop smoking advice from somebody who's never smoked with that caveat there, there's a bit in um tiny habits where he says oh yeah you could build the habit of eating a single square of dark chocolate every day and i just sort of like laughed and went Nope, because if I ate a single square of dark chocolate, I'd have to eat the entire bar. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, well, yeah, but that's a belief, Duncan. That's not actually a proven fact. I mean, true, in the past, you did spend a lot of time eating chocolate by the 200 gram bar, but that does not necessarily mean that it has to be that way. So I thought, oh, I'll just do an experiment. I'll see. I'll buy a bar of chocolate and I'll try and eat just one, uh, one little cube, not... Like, do you ever get the really posh Belgian stuff where the cubes are cubes? Oh, yes. So yes. I mean, like, the little cubes. I had one mm. little cube, and I did it. I ate two bars of chocolate that way and thought, oh, well, apparently I'm a different <laughs> person, and I appear to have developed Whoops. some self-control, so that's <laughs> awfully nice. Well, I, I, you know, the thing is, though, there's that um, – it's sort of a hackneyed phrase, but the uh, success – what is it? Nothing breeds success like succeeding. I'm saying it badly, but you, you do – you quit drinking and like that must have given you, I would assume, a lot of internal confidence. And then you go, well, can I have a piece of chocolate without, you know, eating the entire bar? Like, I, th yeah, I think you you build that up. You build up a, a level of success that that contributes to further success. That's my belief. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely my experience. I, I Technically, I stopped smoking and taking drugs first, but um, I, I did that, and then I stopped drinking, and then I sorted my diet out, and that that period, yeah, it, it definitely, it built one on the other, and mm -hmm. um, I, I think... It's like it's it's actually one of the laws of physics, isn't it? If you if you move something in a direction, given if everything else is equal, it will keep moving in that direction, yeah. and yeah. that's what I did. I started moving in a direction, and everything else being relatively equal, I uh, I kept moving in that direction. But one of the really most interesting things of all, uh, I think there's um, a lot of evidence that actually getting out the other side of something like an alcohol problem is really good for your willpower. Yes. So there's a couple of bits of your brain. There's the prefrontal cortex. That's the bit that makes all of the decisions, the like the, the grown up bit, like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. And then there's <laughs> the, uh, the there's the amygdala, the kind of like the older, smaller bit at the back that's very emotional, very impulsive. And there's a connection between the two. And if you 
look at the brains of people who are active drinkers, that connection is quite weak. But if you oh, look wow. at the brains of people who've come out the other side, that connection is much stronger and not simply much stronger than the people that are drinking. That connection is much stronger than people who never had a problem in the first place. So actually, you end up with more discipline, more self-control and more willpower. Yeah. And it doesn't half annoy my wife. She's like, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, you're really good at doing stuff like that because you're so self-controlled. It's like, do you not remember? I mean, like, really? literally, you know, it wasn't that long ago. But hey-ho. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't know that. That's a fascinating factoid that we've we've built up now a stronger muscle actually to have discipline that's crazy now i've got so now i've got so what i ended up doing by the way i quit drinking and then i threw all of that into work like all of that extra two things actually i threw threw it all into now i'm gonna work you know 900 hours a week i don't think there are 900 hours in a week but pretend there are i, I worked all the time and then i also threw myself into spirituality was was there anything that uh, that you used to replace? I mean, aside except for food, I'm hoping you're going to say Morris dancing because you were probably wondering how I was going to turn the conversation. So, uh, yeah, sadly, no. Uh, they, I, I mean, I, I, I hear you with work. I I did that a little bit. Um, yeah. I I, lo I love writing. I've always been a writer, um, and I wrote. Uh, my first book, kind of in a slightly unhealthy, feverish way with my laptop <laughs> balanced on my legs uh, on the bus to work. Um, sure. So, yeah, a, a, there was a little bit of that. Um, I've, I've also met quite a few people who've gone nuts in the gym. I, I managed to mm -hmm. avoid that, although I am having a bit of a midlife crisis at the moment. So, uh, yeah, I'm doing more exercise than maybe healthy now, so I should uh, I should stop talking. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the social media, playing with my phone, uh, playing stupid games on my phone, all of those kind of things. I fell into a little bit of a trap with those. But it was much easier because I was much more aware. And I think... Mm -hmm. It wasn't just aware from like an intellectual point of view. It was actually aware from kind of a bodily point of view that, uh, you know, I would I would I would spend a lot of time on Facebook or playing stupid games on my phone. And it actually made me feel bad, not like emotionally made me physically feel bad. And yeah. I know I wouldn't have noticed that if I'd still been eating the junk food, smoking oh. and drinking. Um, because yeah. my connection with my body had, had has increased so much that I, I became aware of that. And once I became aware of it, it was like, well, need to dial that back. And now, uh, you know, other than using my phone to call people, <laughs> using it as an actual phone, I know, revolutionary. Yeah, other than I mean, that, you can I, do that? Yeah, I know. It's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? Um, yes. Uh, I really don't use my phone very much at all. Uh, listening to audiobooks and um, calling yeah. my 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 people, uh, that that's about it. So uh, I managed to to rebalance that. Sadly, I don't think I've ever Morris danced to an unhealthy degree. <laughs> I was going. <laughs> When you finished, I was going to say, all right, well, you didn't do it, so I'm going to just be blunt about it. <laughs> but you pulled it back around. Thank you. So well That's all done. Right. And funny enough, it is kind of, it is really tied up with my uh, my, my drinking life in many ways. Because to, to explain to <laughs> to everybody yes. what Morris Dalton is, uh, it's a form of English folk dancing. There are lots of different types, and we might get into it. I do what's called Cotswold Morris, which is we dress in white. Uh, we've got bells around our ankle, uh, well, mm -hmm. our, under, just underneath our knees. Uh, we have ribbons. We have hats with flowers. And we dance up and down to traditional English folk music, uh, usually on a village green. Uh, so, like, genuinely, it is just about, if you think of the most British thing that you can do, it definitely it's up there. Um, <laughs> and as a result, it often happens in pubs. So if you think of like a, a country pub with a nice green bit of grass outside, your sticks and Morris dancers on makes sense. So, yeah, when I started dancing, uh, I was still drinking and mm -hmm. it was it was kind of tied up with that. You know, it was 
I, this is great. I can hang around with a bunch of people who don't think twice about drinking at 10 o'clock in the morning. So they make me mm. look good kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that was one of the reasons why I started. And when I stopped, I was a little bit like, well, what am I going to do? Do I want to keep dancing? I'm not really sure. But I'd made a commitment to the guys. You know, I'd, I'd put my name down for a few events before I decided to stop. So I thought, well, I better go along. And I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I, was quite, I was quite surprised. It's like, I actually like the guys I dance with. They're my friends. And sure. I love dancing. I really love dancing. I love showing off and I love moving my body. And I love the traditional aspect of it. I love that it mm -hmm. is, you know, an, it, it's an important part of the area that I live in. You know, it's part of the history but it's also an ongoing tradition. It's part of the community. You know, there's all of these things. And it sort of dawned on me that for years and years and years, I thought it was about the drinking. But it wasn't. It was not about the drinking. Not one little sure. bit. It was about the people. It was about the places. It was about the community. It was about the tradition. It wasn't ever really about the drinking. So now I love being one of a select band of sober Morris dancers. I love that. That was a beautiful, that was a beautiful bit at the end. Do you, you know, there's a very, of course you know this, but there's a big, there's a big pagan undercurrent to all of that traditional dancing, right? Some of that was originally, you know, dance around a fire kind of thing, you know, as a bard was retelling the oral tradition and whatnot. Um, which is how I know anything about it for was because obviously I said I've never been to the UK. How the hell would I know any of this? But well, Morris Morris dancing gets everywhere. I mean, I know there are quite a few sides in in America. I, I mean, yes, not huge numbers. It's not like you're going to come across it all of the time. But um, yeah, it, it happens. And yeah, I th I think it's one of those one of those things that. You know, it's so it's so fundamental to just being a human. Mm -hmm. and I think dancing is is such an important part of of celebration and, and moving your bodies. It's just it, it, it moving your body in time with other people. It is as old as the hills themselves. Yes, you know, it goes all the way back to sitting around a campfire, singing, shuffling your feet, kind of thing. Uh, I, I, along with storytelling, which I'm also a huge fan of, uh, you know, I think right. they're, they're very kind of ancient human activities. So yeah, it's 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 something that universal. It happens all over the world, like every country or oh, every region of every country, every town practically has its own folk dancing tradition. And uh, you know, I, I'm, what we're seeing a lot of is Appalachian clog dancing. That's really mm -hmm. big in the UK at the moment. And obviously, uh, you know, it's made its way over to the pond. And uh, I love it when the, uh, yeah. when the traditions sort of spread out and merge and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. different bits kind of influence each other. It's, it's great. Yeah. I, I forget. Correct me if I'm wrong. Cause I think that if I remember the style of dance, it comes from the Moors in in, in, I guess, England. So it's from right central, like central England, actually dancing on the moors. I no, so the, the, well, the, the thing is nobody really knows, but if you okay. ask the academics, they will say it comes from the word Moorish, which is okay. the, the moors, but in Spain. Um, so uh, North Africa uh, yeah. then was conquered by the um, a, a sort of, early Islamic empire uh, conquered the south of Spain, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where Moorish uh, theatre and Moorish dancing come from. And it spread around the courts of Europe in the sort of like 16, uh, well, 1500s, late 1400s. Uh, and it, it started off as being very kind of the, the dance of royalty. And then, of course, mm -hmm. What do we do? Well, you know, we all try to dance like Taylor Swift, don't we? And she's she's <laughs> as close as you're going to get to royalty these days. Pretty much, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, you know, the, the the polls like me, we all copied the royalty, uh, and that's how it kind of di dissipated out into to, to little villages. And of course, yeah. the the royalty and the aristocrats they stopped doing it a long time ago, but uh, we haven't caught up yet. But the the Spanish dance is much more. 
much swishier I've seen than than Morris than the yeah. than the English so anyway. The, the... If you happen to have a time machine and you go back, and the, one of the things like about all of this is just speculation because okay. it's very hard to carbon date dancing, isn't it? Well, true. Yeah, yeah. But there's <laughs> there's things like um, John Playford wrote a book in the uh, in in about 1600 where he talked about a lot of these dances okay. and. If you, uh, you barn dances or Kayleys, those kind of things, they're, they're more like that. They're kind of more basic uh, partner dances or group dances. And then okay. if you actually look at the kind of dances that they have in uh, in uh, John Playford's book, um, you can see some of the moves that, that we use and, you know, you see how it's kind of moved from, from that. People misremember it. They invent their own new bits. Uh, you know, <laughs> living tradition. All right. Gosh, maybe my maybe my comment earlier about the pagan connection was not exactly on point. Uh, I'll have to go and read a book. Well, I, I mean, the, the the thing is, folk dancing, which is all Morris dancing really is, folk dancing. Okay. Yes, pagans folk dance. Hindus goes folk way dance. Back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, Muslims folk dance. Everybody folk dances. It's just that it happens all over the world. Uh, some yeah. of it, uh, you know, we we go on fancy holidays and um, pay a lot of money to watch. Uh, some of it, <laughs> right. yeah, Morris dancing, not so much. But well, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll I'll have a holiday in the next you know year or so, and I'll come out and I'll I'll uh, I'll sit in the audience for you. What do you think? Oh yeah, well you'd be most welcome. I mean, you, 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 most of the places we dance, you don't get to sit; you have to stand and watch. But that's but, fine. Um, yeah, I would be more than happy to okay. take you to something like Oxford Folk Festival, where you have a lot of different sides, and you know, I'll point out the clog dancers and the mm -hmm. Border Morris and the Molly and all of the weird and wonderful different types of dancing. It would be awesome. I think it would be awesome, and then we can share a seltzer, like a like a like a, a glass of seltzer water at the end. It would be great. <laughs> I was really unsure how we were going to work that into this conversation, but I'm glad we did. I don't know if anybody else. We, you had made the joke. We'll just put it in the middle because people will already be hooked, and hopefully that didn't just like make everybody leave because it was. I think it was. I think it's fun. Well, look, it's 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 going to go one of two ways. I mean, maybe we could, maybe we talk about the agrarian reforms of the 16th century now because <laughs> nobody's listening. <laughs> sure, lay it on me. If you, no, let's hold off. Um, that could be a separate episode, okay? So that way, people will go. Well, okay, I'll just, I'll just. I know I have to skip that one, the agrarian reform episode. Yeah, and when your Instagram blows up. With people wanting to know about the agrarian reform. Incidentally, I know absolutely nothing about that. It's just this phrase that I've memorized where I, because it, it sounds really, really boring. And occasionally <laughs> I drop it in. And the other day I was emceeing an event and I said, oh, I could always do my 45 minute symposium on the agrarian reforms of the 16th century. And like these guys at the front were like going, Reforms, reforms, reforms. I'm like, oh no, you've called me on it now. Right, <laughs> right. Nothing about this. Which it would be even better, actually, if you get up and you go, okay, so 45 minutes. Um, so back in the 16th century, they did the agrarian thing. And uh, they had to reform it. And then just dead air for like 44 minutes and 30 seconds, right? You have the guys in the front going, reform. Yeah, maybe maybe I should just do some actual research so I could do a minute and a half of it. Because I don't think it would have taken them long to start telling, <laughs> shut up, shut up, shut up. Right, right. No, actually, it's, I think it's even better to know nothing about it. You know, to, to be able to say, I will talk about this. And then I actually, I lied. Sorry, I didn't know you were going to take me up on it. If I'd known... I would have prepared, but I didn't. So there you go. But <laughs> so I will say though, so we are running out of time. And, and uh, I mean, I just want to, you know, thank you so much for 
for everything. I've wanted to have a conversation like this for a long time because I think that there's, you even said maybe before we started recording that we really don't talk about these things. It's, it's, it's completely normal. I, I don't remember how you put it, but it was, you know, it's, it's normal to have this sort of abnormal way of, way of coping and, 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 uh, so thank you for all the work you do because it's very, very Im- important. Yeah, no, well, no, I mean, I quite agree. I think it's something that's that's not talked about anywhere near enough. I, you know, most people, when they talk about alcohol, it's just, oh, it's nearly one o'clock. You deserve that GNT, even though it is 4.30 right. on Tuesday afternoon. You know, I, so I, I, I thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, uh, you know, start that conversation and hopefully – get people to think a little bit, reflect, maybe even. And, uh, you know, I, I would just encourage all of your listeners to um, to support uh, the wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, subscribe. Mm-hmm. You told them how to do that right at the start. And I know they'll be getting an absolute ton of value from you. So uh, subscribe, Thank everybody. You. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to – this will sound like I'm responding, but it's, you offer a lot of services, and I want to make sure that uh, that people can find you. How do we find Duncan Baskaran Brown? On well, the if you can spell Baskaran Brown, it's I'm really easy to find, but most people can't even say it. So <laughs> to make it simpler for people, what I'd like to do is offer them a bit of a gift. So if you put getover.uk into the internet, that's getover.uk, that will take you to a bit of my website where you'll be able to download a copy of Get Over Indulgence, my uh, first book um, that's like a PDF or a Kindle version uh, it's absolutely free um, I tell you a little bit more about what I did how I did it I don't want to kind of like ruin it by saying you might learn something you know genuinely <laughs> it is just kind of quite good fun and um, it's sort yeah. of short so uh, yeah have a little bit of a look at that and actually get over.uk will take you to a bit of my website um, and you can find out more about all of the stuff that I do there. You can find me on all of the socials through that as well. I am pretty busy on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. If you've got any questions, uh, you know, please reach out, uh, ask. I might not be able to help you, but I'm confident I will know somebody who, who will be able to. That's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I've got, so I'll have links. I know I have links to Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and I will add the get over link as well. But um, yeah, gosh, so great. Thank you so much for this conversation. Really appreciate that. It's my absolute pleasure. Cool. All right. Well, I will go ahead and shut this down. This is my little standard ending at this point. I will say that I am Amethyst Herrick. I've been speaking with Duncan Baskaran Brown on Gender Identity Weekly, and we spoke about all kinds of good things like um, how alcohol doesn't need to be your default choice, and also the increased strength between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala um, caused by by learning this sort of discipline, being able to apply this sort of discipline. So thank you to all our listeners, and thank you to you, Duncan. <laughs>